Welcome, we're here today with Michael Capone from the Capone Group and the Haiti Empowerment Mission. Michael, you've been a huge inspiration to a lot of people here at FIU, including myself, and we'd like to ask you a few questions. Okay. Um, you've been a part of the nightlife in Miami for quite some time now, and uh, we want to know, um, how did you begin and why? Probably at the right place at the right time. Um, my father was in, in nightlife, believe it or not, in the in the 60s in Belgium, and my grandfather was also in nightlife, um, you know, really early in the 20s and 30s. But um, I was just surfing and skating around, you know, the late 80s of South Beach when it was starting to kind of get transformed. And it just happened organically from literally, you know, meeting some models on the beach and giving them a flyer and doing a, you know, a little party with like 50 people and some, some fire torches on the beach to, you know, nightclubs kind of moving in and, and the whole thing just grew like naturally. It was interesting. Nice. Uh, it, what club was your first event and how, how did it go? The only club back in the day was the Cameo Theater was like a punk rock theater for like, you know, The Clash and Sex Pistols and, and, and um, we went in there, I think in 89, and we started the first hip hop night and it was with like Tribe Called Quest, Public Enemy, and it was called One for like Global, we had a company called Global Tribe and it was all about unity. And th that was like the very beginning of the hip hop movement. This was like pre any jet setters that ever like showed up in Miami Beach. There was nothing. There was the news cafe on Ocean Drive. It was like what, what it looked like in Scarface, plus like a news cafe on Ocean Drive and like the cameo. And then there was a, a very famous gay club called um, the Warsaw Ballroom. And then we had some momentum going. We went in there and asked if we can do like a straight night in the gay club. And, and uh, we closed off the block on Española Way. We had like Harley Davidsons and playing the doors and Zeppelin and everything. And, and, uh, and it like kind of launched that, that movement. So all of a sudden on Saturday nights in like South Beach, you know, right in like 1990, there was like a big scene going on on Española Way. And then the spot opened across the street so there was like this whole cameo bar, Warsaw ballroom spot, and it was like this, like the center. Kind of how it all began. And um, how did you become the prince of nightlife? I don't know. That's, I, I obviously never named myself that, but um. <laughs> <laughs> was there a particular event that was the catalyst of of this? I have no event? clue. No clue. Uh, what happens? Uh, was that? Oh. Uh, what would you say um, set you up, set your events apart from the events going on at the time? I think at that time there was no such thing as strategically sitting down and saying, you know, what's going to work. It was more of whatever's going on in your consciousness is what the theme is going to be. So. You fall in love, you like red flowers, and then the whole club's decorated with red flowers. And that's all that's happening in South Beach anyway, so there's really no competition, so it doesn't really matter. So it was just happening, like, you know, like Jurassic Park would be like a really big movie, so we would make like giant paper mache dinosaurs and put them all over the club, you know, and, and we would have this kind of, you know, theme going on, or it would be, at that time, we were trying to use the people coming as the audience of nightlife as like a learning environment. So if it was Martin Luther King's birthday, there'd be projections of uh, Ku Klux Klan members against like, you know, Martin Luther King, like, and it'd be like peace. So everything had substance at the time. You know, I remember the first time a celebrity ever walked into one of my events, it was like 1990, it was like Eddie Murphy, I think, and and he asked for like a private table and he wanted a, a rope around his table. And I like yelled at him, I was like, you're a VIP, what, you, could, you could deserve like a special area because you're a celebrity and like we wouldn't do it. 
So at that time, it was a completely different ball game. You know, you look at today now, it's like, you know, everybody's got a table, you got to pay like $5,000, yeah. you know, so different era. Who was the, the biggest influence starting off in Miami, like starting you off in the Miami li nightlife scene? Who was my biggest influence? Yes. In what, nightlife? In or nightlife. Well, I initially worked for uh, an ex-model guy turned promoter. His name was Gary James. And um, I, I started by passing out flyers for his parties on my skateboard. <laughs> and, and then I became like 50-50 partners with him, like, I think like a year later and stuff. So and I guess essentially he brought me in. Um, how did you transition from nightlife into real estate and development? So, um, about 10 years ago, uh, architect Chad Oppenheim and developer Greg Coven came up to me and said, let's do a tower and let's like put your name on it and make it like a trendy building kind of thing. So at that time, I, was, I, I laughed. I didn't think it was really serious. So the tower became Time Museum Park. And I was basically like the, the front man for it. My job was to throw a big party, launch it, hype it up, give everybody the brochures, and kind of make it like the in-building where everybody wanted to live. And luckily, at, at that time, you know, I think it was 2004, the market was on fire, like it is now again. And we sold that building out in like nine days. I remember Wall Street Journal was like, that was a sell this fastest sellout in, in South Florida history before George Perez sold out the icon, I think, in like eight days. But, um, you know, those were different times in, in real estate. You know, you could buy a lot, hire an architect, make a rendering of a tower, throw a party, sell out the whole building, collect 20% deposits, and, you know, Call use bank <laughs> funds to build the building. Right. That's amazing. Can't um, do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say the biggest highlight of your career was? would be? Biggest highlight? Yeah. Hmm. You know, there's like four different facets to what I do. There's, there's the, what I would call the engine, which is like a, the promotion and social world, right? So that's like, knowing a lot of people and that's attached to nightlife and you know knowing who's who and celebrities and all that and that little world may not bring in a lot of income but it gets you certain uh, credits you know with, in, with newspaper publications and those kind of things and then there's construction industry, which you know, I, mean, I, I run a construction company, like a GC business, mm -hmm. which is not that fun at all, where you build homes for people and you get to create a lot of really beautiful things, you know? So you get to drive around, you know, North Bay Road and Venetian Island and all that and say, I built that house, I built that house, I built that house. And there's some reward in that, but and then there's the development business, which is you have a, a concept or an idea and you want to, you know, create something from scratch. And so let's say I want to create a, a building. You utilize the people that you know, right, to like hype it up so you can sell the building quicker. So you can't really do one without the other. But the whole machine in my world needs to function to spit out the ability to be able to make the world better, do good things, have foundations, everything. So now we get into like the socially responsible entrepreneurship, right? Which is what I think, not that I'm a, the better model for it. There's much better models out there and there's much wealthier, powerful people, but it would be nice if most companies decided to distribute partial of their funds and everything to like, you know, different things and causes that they care about, right? So then in the end, if you make X amount of millions every year, 
you've also contributed to X amount of orphanages or water wells or homeless shelters or everything, right? So now you have a reason to be in business right. other than to just drive around in your fancy car and, you know, right. live a life for your own self, so. And uh, what, what would you consider your definition of success to be? That, but on a much more important level, you know. Um, we're, we're, we're like in, in, in what I would say, getting our feet wet, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so when you have a, a much bigger platform, like Oprah has a serious platform, or Bill Gates has a serious platform, or like Richard Branson has a serious platform, then you can really start doing mass change, statistic change mm -hmm. on Earth, not, you know. Rebels. <laughs> I've helped, you know. 100 kids in Haiti, which is great, but it's, again, getting your feet wet. But if everybody helped 100 kids in Haiti, or just uh, one kid in Haiti, right, yeah. and, you know, the, the dynamics change. And it, it's, I think that's the most important thing I want to get across in this interview. You know, we live in a planet that has 7 billion people right now. Nearly 80% of the planet makes less than $10 a day. 80% of the planet really is not that educated and lives in what we call second or third world. But if the top 20% of the planet, right, decided to each take on some responsibilities, like, hmm, in my lifetime, I'm going to help six people. I'm going to help this homeless person. I'm going to make sure he gets a job. I'm going to help this person in Haiti. I'm going to make sure he goes to school, puts him through education, and help this person in Africa. What would happen if one billion people each helped six billion people, mm. six people, mm. right? Generation later, you'd have a much different statistic, right? It might not look like the same ratio I brought up. Mm. So that's what the goal is. It's not about patting yourself on the back that you know, you've helped these people in Haiti. Like, I don't, I don't even want to have this conversation. The, the conversation is getting everybody at FIU to go in this new era where all of them, right, mm. will help six people in their lifetimes, right? Because right. if this whole school does that, you just changed massive, massive change, I mm -hmm. think. So the idea is to make waves, not ripples. Yeah. I like it. Um, do you ever feel kind of like a celebrity yourself? Or no? It's maybe in my past, you know, egocentric lives, but no, you, you, you work, we work very hard uh, to get rid of the ego and, and to, you know, be more at peace. It's about others, not yourself. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a quick break right now, and uh, Aaron will be continuing the interview. We're back here with Michael Capone. I'm Aaron Guerrero. What's up, Michael? How you doing? So, where do you get your determined attitude from? Does it come from a family member or is it just in you? I think it's in me. I think I've been uh, pretty gung-ho my whole life. It has its pros and cons. Everything does. Speaking about pros, I heard they had a uh, construction company, Capone Building Company, am I correct? Yeah, it's called Capone Shear Construction, but yeah. Oh, close enough. Anyways, I really like your model, Watch Our Speed. What, did, what does that mean to you and where did you get it from? <laughs> It just means if you're jogging down the neighborhood and the house just started, pay attention because when you're jogging six months later, the house will be finished. That's it's fast? That's kind of the concept. Good stuff. So, so you're from Belgium, correct? Yeah. Have you ever considered going back there to live or possibly retire if you choose to retire? No, I don't think anybody that could live in Florida with sun and ocean would ever want to go back to cloudy skies and rain 24-7. But to visit, yeah. I feel like cloudy skies and rain, you always go to Seattle. But anyways, having accomplished so much in your life so far, where do you expect to go from here? Um, there's a lot more to do. And then I think you reverse it. I think in, in the end of your life, you start giving everything away and you start, you know, you build, 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 and then you give, 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 right? Look at like big models in the world, like Bill Gates again. What's he doing when he dies? He's giving 
everything away. So those are important attributes to have, knowing that, because what you build is not just for yourself. So looking back on your career so far, is there anything that you would have done differently? Yeah, everything. Really? <laughs> of course. We may make mistakes every minute, you know? But that's what life's about. It's about learning. That's what we're on earth to do, right? We're in school. You guys are in school at FIU, but we're really in school on earth. That's what our like, souls are here to do. They're here to learn. So every mistake we make is actually like a lesson learned. So it's good. So speaking of lessons, do you have any advice that you want to give to anybody who possibly wants to follow in your footsteps? Yeah, just, uh, you know, give it all you've got, and it doesn't matter when you fall. You get right back up, and you do it again. Just like that? Just like that. Well, we're going to take a short break. Thank you, Michael, for this interview, and now we're going to pass it to you, Nina. Welcome back. I'm Yanina Velas. Since the year 2001, I've been part of the nonprofit organization Rescue Earth, which raises social and environmental awareness in our local communities. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Michael Caponi and to talk about a topic that we both share. Michael, how, how are you? I'm great, how are you? Great, great. So we know that since the year 2010, when the earthquake hit Haiti, you've been extremely active. What was your <coughs> mission well there was definitely no mission in the beginning the mission was you know there's a tragedy that occurred and i felt i had to do something so the first thing i did was ask our city commissioners on miami beach if i can take the fire department there immediately i thought you know i kind of sold it to them as this will be really good for miami beach to get involved but i don't think anybody had any idea what we were getting ourselves into at, at, at that time. You know, we were there, uh, you know, right after it happened, a couple of days after, and, you know, it was, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a, a Vietnam vet story, you know. It's, uh, if you weren't there in the beginning, there's like something you now hold that, you know, you probably won't be able to talk to anybody on earth other than the people who were there. You know, those, uh, an immense amount of, you know, dead bodies everywhere. There was a stench. There was, you know, there was probably 50 army helicopters, you know, flying above. There was, like, hummers on the ground. There's, like, lines from here to there of, like, dead bodies piled on each other. There's, like, there's, like, literally, like, machines coming and, like, scooping bodies and putting them in, like, mass graves. So you're, you're dealing with, you know, an enormous amount of, of emotions where you, I remember walking, I remember feeling like there was such an intense moment that it was like God had to like almost like give you a pin and needles and like transform you. And it was like, you know, now you're in a different like body almost. So we're marked. The reason I start the topic with that is you're like imprinted and marked if you were there in the beginning with you got touched. So we tried to do what we could. You know, we went to a hospital that had no doctors and you know, there was endless amount of people and in the first stage, you know, you had giant pieces of concrete that fell on people's arms. So the arm had been, you know, basically ripped off for like three days. There was no like alcohol or disinfectants. So the arm is like, you know, filled with maggots and like, you know, insect in it. And, you know, it's a pretty treacherous situation where the fire guys had to like literally grab jigsaws and like cut people's arms and legs off. So it's a very insane uh, first hand experience in there. So when you come back to Miami, and you just left, and you just left, you know, literally 100 people with no arms and legs and everything you saw, you have two choices. You can go on TV and be the hero, or you can come back and, like, tell everybody, raise a bunch of money, and go right back, because the mission was certainly not over in the very beginning. 
So tell us about that journey, starting the foundation, Haiti Empowerment Foundation. Haiti Empowerment came like literally a, like a year later. I think the first, the second trip was we just cut off limbs to people and they're left in the middle of an open field with no home, no means, no food, nothing. So the second one was you need to bring bandages, you need to bring them a tent, you need to bring them like something to walk on. You know, so, so that was like mission two. And then mission three was, you know, now this field, this like football field, imagine, is like filling up really quickly. So now the entire football field needs like a tent. And then when you bring everybody a tent, then, you know, they need water. So you need to bring giant water trucks and, you know, you, you have to like power the field basically. So. A lot of people took on the responsibility of running what we called makeshift camps at the time, right? Sean Penn had the biggest one. He was managing like a 60,000 person makeshift camp. I was managing a 3,000 person makeshift camp. And there was 20 other thousand foundations managing each like foundation, uh, I mean makeshift camps. There was at one point, you know, there was like a million people that were like basically living in like tents. So it was a very large situation. And it's something that I think it's another conversation, but the world needs to understand that these kind of things are going to become more and more in the future. This is all of what happened in Haiti is basically a climatic like refugee situation. It's when the earth has a problem, right? It cracks. It first cracked in Haiti because it's on a triple fault line. But it created a series of disasters that moves large masses of people into like situations where they have no resources. So the big picture of helping Haiti is, you know, completely understanding the history of the country and trying to come up with a master plan for it. In the first year, I don't think it was about a master plan yet. It was about, you know, attending to the needs of like, you know, a million homeless people that are like living in tents because it's very expensive to do that. You know, it's extremely expensive and, you know. How many trips have you done since the earthquake? 70 or something. 70. And what was the reaction of people at your, each of your arrival? I mean, each trip's been completely different. Like I said, there was, there was, whenever, when someone loses everything and you bring them a tent, it's like, you know, buying someone a house on Star Island, you know, because they're so humble and happy for it. But then a hurricane comes and there's no more tents. So then you have to bring, you know, a new kind of housing. And then cholera comes, you know, and then you have to, you know, deal with that situation and the deaths that came out of that. And, trying to bring everybody, you know, water purification filters and, and all that. And then another hurricane comes and then that all the villages is completely isolated, desolated again. You know, so that country has been struck with, you know, this like endless series of karmic situations that have occurred there um, that have made it very, very difficult. You know, to help even today, after all that, there's still a couple hundred thousand people still homeless, like four years later, you know, mismanaged money everywhere. Um, it's, it's been quite an undertaking. So tell us how, from helping them just with resources, now you are educating them, you have a village. Tell us a little bit about that journey. So I had to, based on the resources that we had and what I knew that Miami and the people that I knew were able to give, which we weren't able to raise really more than $100,000 a year or something like that, that you can't help everybody. So you have to make a really difficult decision. You've got 3,000 people in the field. You basically, you know, we had to basically uh, set up a, uh, almost like a, a survey table and we interviewed like all 3,000 people. Hello, are you interested in your kids going to school? Would you like to learn about business? Would you like to be empowered? 
what if we made a deal with you and we promised that your kids would go to private school and we trained you to have jobs and everything, would you follow all our orders, yes or no? And we interviewed everybody. You know, we had notebooks of people that said yes, yes, yes. And we had to pick, unfortunately. It's a very difficult thing to do. So we picked about 100 people, because that's all we can afford to take on. It's a lot already, right? You have a brother and sister, imagine how much like putting them through school and making sure they have a car and all that. Imagine having 100 people that you're completely responsible for now, you know? And they reproduce, like, you know, now there's like 120. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we, we moved them over to a coastal town which is in the same geographical location in like Casa de Campo uh, in Dominican Republic, right? So if, you had, if this was the island, that would be Jacmo, that would be Casa de Campo. So, so it has the same potential, it's the same island, it's the same waters, it's just on the opposite sides. Um, so that alone should tell you a lot right there, right? So the Fan Hools are very powerful people. They knew what they were doing in Dominican Republic and, and that kind of was the beginning catalyst that transformed that country. In the 80s, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, Haiti was actually the wealthier country. And it was, you know, the more prominent place. And Dominican was like, ugh. Today, Dominican Republic is the richest country in the entire uh, Caribbean, right? And it has the, the largest GDP. Haiti, in the entire Caribbean, is the poorest country. And not only is it the poorest country in the Caribbean, it's the second poorest country on Earth. <laughs> and it's the poorest country in, the, in our hemisphere. And it's the exact same island, right? So that, that's, think about that a little bit. So it has all the potential because it's the same island. But what's the problem? It's like wrong management, obviously, right? It's like managed improperly. One island is managed properly, the other. So, Looking at it historically, and I want to say this in this interview because most people don't understand what Haiti did. The Haiti, when, when all the Caribbean islands were, were found by the Spanish, the French, and, and the English, the town of Jacmel, where I brought the people, was like one of the most important coffee ports in the Caribbean. And it was called the Jewel of the Caribbean. So Napoleon, thought that that was like the most beautiful place that he had been to. And he set up like an entire French colonial town there. But the slaves there rebelled quicker than anywhere else in the Caribbean. And there the slaves were like, we're not having it. So while Napoleon was dealing with all his other wars, Russia and everywhere else, he sent his fleet over to Haiti to fight the rebellious slaves, and they lost. So they actually won a battle against Napoleon's armies. So you can think psychologically how they feel. They're like, wow, we conquered the world's most powerful army, right? And we won freedom in our country. So you gotta give Haitians credit for that. They are the first independent black free nation. What nobody knows is that when Thomas Jefferson was president, he would meet with Napoleon and he'd be like, wow, we certainly don't want anyone to know in the United States that there's a free black nation in the Caribbean. That would spawn right, emancipation of slavery instantly. So that would be very problematic. So let's isolate them. Let's put ships around Haiti, and let's just make sure that nobody knows about it and that they have nothing. And that's basically the story of Haiti. So Haiti was like, because no one wanted to know that it was a free black nation, they were like left on an island. Imagine being netted in Africa, thrown on an island, and then the French pull all their resources out, and then they just put a bunch of boats around it and say, figure it out, guys. Right? So it's going to be tough. Right? They had never gone through a process of learning yet how to be civilized. Right? The Spanish who came right, into the Dominican Republic had already been civilized and learned to build things and castles and stuff for thousands of years. While here you're taking people 
from the jungle in Africa, throwing them on an island and then leaving them to rot and die. So what's happened is these corrupt leaders emerge. It's like, you know, kind of like the gangster on the corner, you know, like I run the block, you know, he gets the power of the people, he gets a couple of machine guns, all of a sudden he's like the general or the gorilla, that's what's going on in Africa for the last thousands of years. And all of a sudden they gain power. So they've been like robbed and robbed and robbed of like military coup leaders like endlessly, you know, and, it, and, and, and they don't know any better. So all of a sudden we come in now, you know, Clinton, Donna Karen, you know, a lot of very intelligent people and like, you know, there was an earthquake in this country, you know, needs help, but then the problem is a thousand times greater than like an earthquake. It's not like everyone was living in like suburbia driving cars and an earthquake came and they lost it. You just have to rebuild it. You have to basically like rewind the tape like a good 200 years and you have to like start everything from scratch. You have to like really educate them. You have to like, so it's been an amazing um, experience just doing that with a hundred people. You know, if you look on my Facebook today, like half our kids are friends with me on Facebook. They like, they have iPads and they're like on the internet. Like they know what's going on now. Like they can start speaking English, you know? So again, uh, I'm so for the internet and you know, there's, there's a friend of mine, Martin Boot, he's starting like a mini iPad massive program where they literally distribute like mini iPads to like the whole country, you know? So you're throwing like education on like masses. And it's one of the most important things. So, so what the foundation that I have called Haiti Empowerment Mission does, I guess if you had to sum it up, it would say we are trying to grow leaders. You have like a crop field and you know that in the crop field, there's going to be like a couple of really good crops. And out of the 100, maybe 10 will be amazing. And maybe five will actually be like leaders in their areas and things, right? So if every little foundation and stuff can start growing some good crops, right? You'll have new leaders emerge out of the country in the next generation that can really transform it. Because as long as it's the old way, the, you know, the guy with the machine guns that's going to take over the country. It's, they're going to keep the country poor and they're just going to like extract it. So. I agree. I, I agree with you on education and I believe the children are, you know, the soul of the world and that's great. So how many kids do, do you have um, in the village? Like 70 or something. 70. Yeah, it's like 30 families, 30 families, 70 kids. They have a lot of kids. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what is your vision for, for Haiti, Michael, from here to 10 years? Well, the, 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 the big picture would be to give it legs so it can be self-sustainable. It's, it's, um, it's gotten used to too much aid, which is also very bad. And, you know, I hate to say this, but it is very bad because it, it creates, you know, a non-willingness to work. And unfortunately, what's even worse about it is the aid comes in chunks from other governments, but it gets handed to corrupt Haitian governments. So if Venezuela, right, country, U.S. is like enemy, Venezuela actually gave, you know, um, Haiti, you know, a hundred million dollars. But if the Haitian government doesn't utilize that properly, it doesn't even get to the people. Right? So what you don't want it to do is just you know, make it so all the politicians in Haiti, you know, drive around in nice cars and have all nice fancy things and then it never really gets to the people and stuff. But, so that's been the game. The United Nations grants X amount of billion dollars a year. It gets to a corrupt leader and then they distribute it among their friends, among their parliament. And like little, like tiny little things get distributed actually to the people. So that's why today, like, I believe in earmarking, you know, donations and, you know, 
you give me $100, you're going to help this little child. He's going to go to this school, and here's a picture of him. And, you know, you're really doing it that way. So the big picture is that it doesn't need any of that anymore, and that it has its own economies. So what would be the three main economies? The first one would be agriculture, of course. It's an agricultural country. So you would have all kinds of resources from bananas, coffee, you know, mangoes. We're seeing already uh, 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 a, uh, mangoes at Whole Foods right now. If you look, they're like Haitian mangoes. Clinton did that through Clinton Global Initiative, which is major. You know, this is employing like you know, half a million people kind of and doing these kind of things. So, so those are the really big ideas, I think. But then tourism is great too because tourism makes it kind of be on the cover of, you know, Condé Nast Traveler, Haiti, the coolest place, you know, this celebrity went to Haiti. So that kind of helps with, it's like, renewing its image, right? Is it going to bring in as much dollars to the country as agriculture? Absolutely not. Is it vital to getting, like, us to go there, and then we go there, and then we invest, right? And then American entrepreneurs own businesses in Haiti, right? And, Marriott's gone there now and all different kinds of things like that. So remember, you're like, you were starting from scratch. There's like zero, nothing, you know. There's just a bunch of people in the country that have like managed to rob it for the last X hundred years. And there's a, there's a handful of very wealthy families that control everything. And one guy sells gas to the people. One guy sells, you know, whatever, you know, the concrete and cement to the people. And that's it. And they monopolized all that. So you gotta, I don't wanna sound socialist, but you've gotta you know, spread that out, out of the hands of you know, the very rich and powerful, but not in a communistic manner, obviously like Castro did, but you have to do it right. You have to bring in very intelligent you know, international businesses to come in and like, give fruit to the country. Right? Factories, clothing, like why are we going to China to you know, make clothes? You know, when you can have, you know, th they make $6 a day in Haiti. You know, you could give them $10 a day. You'd be, the, you'd be, you know, an angel if you did that. So why, why import all the things and, you know, so far away when we have so many resources that are so close that can help? Definitely. So tell us where can people go and, and help? Your website, the... They can help by any way they want. They can help by going and visiting Haiti and, and going there. They can go there by joining any foundation and just going and doing, you know, helping out at an orphanage for a week. They can help by buying mangoes at, you know, Whole Foods. Because the more people that buy them, the more demand you'll have, you know. But again, tourism is very important because if you tomorrow fly to Haiti, imagine what you're going to do. You're going to get out of the airport, someone's going to grab your suitcase. You're going to give them five bucks, right? Then you're going to get in a taxi. You're going to give that guy $10. Then you're going to go to your hotel. Your maid's going to make your bed. The hotel owner's going to pay his rent. You're going to eat chicken. The guy is going to sell his chickens, right? And then you're going to get an omelet in the morning. And then there's a little farmer that, like, is going to bring eggs in the morning. So you have, like, a, a ripple domino effect. So people don't understand, like, one tourist equals, like, literally, like, the United Nations say, like, 80 times 80. It goes out 80-fold. You're going to go to the beach and you're going to buy a bracelet from someone for five bucks, right? By the time you leave Haiti, you'll have affected, statistically, 80 Haitians will have some kind of benefit from you, like, going there. So imagine if you could take, right now, it's got the lowest rate of tourism of all the country of the Caribbean. Haiti wants to go there, right? Imagine if you got 10 million tourists to go to Haiti a year. 10 million times 80. Okay, 800 million affected jobs. Now you transform the country. Well, thank you, Michael. We definitely need uh, more minds like yours. And uh, we hope that you accomplish all your goals in Haiti. And um, thank you for having us today, okay? Welcome. We appreciate it. Thank you, that was the end of our interview and we'll see you next time. <laughs>